Welcome back students. This is the first lecture in a new section on multi-threaded applications. I think most of us are aware that modern computers can have multiple processes running simultaneously, and each of those processes is completely independent. They have their own memory allocated for them. They don't have to share memory or, or other computing resources. In fact, if you have a multi-core CPU in your computer, which most modern computers do, the different processes may actually be running on completely different central processing units. And many people think of a thread as the same of a process, and they are similar. Threads are an independent set of instructions, but each process can also have multiple threads inside that process. And while the threads are independent, they also share some of the same resources like they'll be running in the same memory space, even though they can't interact with each other by normal means. So if you have multiple threads running in the same process, you can't access a variable that was created in one thread from the other thread. They are independent, even though they share resources. And because they're independent, that means that what's happening in one thread doesn't affect what's happening in the other thread. And this allows us to do what we call background processing. So we'll do our main computations in one thread in the background. And while that thread's running, it won't interfere with your user interface. And you may think back to our progress bar example and say, well, we already know how to keep a processing application from blocking the user interface using the queue applications process events method. And that will work in a lot of situations. When you're going through a loop and each execution of the loop only takes a very short period of time, you can call that process events. And it appears like it's not interfering because you're going back and processing the events in the event loop, you know, every tenth of a second or something like that. But it is actually blocking. And if the execution of the loop takes a second, your user interface starts getting really jerky. And if it takes a minute, then it really starts blocking. And so, there are a lot of situations where using that approach doesn't solve the problem of blocking the user interface. There's also a case where the background processing may not be in a loop. It may just be one massive computation that takes a long period of time. And so, again, in that case, the process events method won't help you. But in these situations, you can run your main processing application in a separate thread from what the user interface is working in, and we'll still have a responsive user interface. Now, the way that processes and threads are implemented depend on your operating system. They're very similar concepts, but they are implemented differently. And fortunately, Qt provides a platform-independent method for using threads. So like everything else in Qt, if you use the Qt method of doing things, then you don't have to worry about moving to a different operating system. You can run that same code no matter what the operating system. And the way Qt implements threading is through a Qt thread class. And there's a number of ways that you can implement threading in the Qt thread class. We're just going to look at one in this course, but it's a very useful one. One that is used in the case where you just want to do some processing operation in the background that takes a long time. And that processing operation doesn't have any user interface of its own. It's just in the background crunching numbers. Now, there are cases where you might want to have a separate thread with the user interface running in that separate thread. And in that case, you have to do things a little bit differently because that thread's going to have its own execution loop. And so you have to start that execution loop. It's not really terribly more difficult. I think it's a lot less common, especially for simpler applications. But it is possible. You can see how you do that in the documentation if you need it. But for the purposes of this course, we're just going to think about multi-threading in the context of creating a background processing operation. And to implement this in QThread, we have to create a worker class that's a subclass of QThread. And we, we know how to do this. We've been doing it throughout this course. Even though we may not have discussed it much using this terminology, 
But for instance, when we create our dialog main class and we pass it a queue dialog as the parent class, then our dialog main is a subclass of the queue dialog class. We can use all the queue dialog methods and we can also create our own methods. And so creating a worker class that's a subclass of queue thread is not fundamentally different from that. And then in that worker class, there's a run method that's a method from queue thread. And we override that run method, and that's where we put the code for our processing operation. Again, we haven't necessarily talked a whole lot about overriding methods so much in this course, although we've done it quite a bit. For instance, when we subclass our queue dialog to create our dialog main class, and that queue dialog has a constructor method that we call that double underscore init. And we override that because we create a new init class in our dialog main. And that's actually overriding the constructor class for the queue dialog object. So we're creating our own constructor method with our custom code in it. And so again, this is not fundamentally different. We're just overriding the run method from queue thread with our own run method, which is where all our processing takes place. And then in our main application, we can create an instance of the worker class, which is easy enough to do, right? We just call the worker class's constructor method. And then when we want to start the processing operation, we call the instance's start method. And that's going to begin the worker class's run method, which again, remember, is where all our processing takes place. And QThread is smart enough to know that that run method needs to be executed in a separate thread and it takes care of all of that for you and it's that easy you're running a background process in a separate thread now we said that threads are independent you can't access a variable created in one thread from another thread so we have a main application running in one thread and our worker class running in a separate thread and what if we want to be able to communicate between the two threads? What if we want our worker class, for instance, to update a progress bar or at least let us know when it's finished and return some data when it's finished? Well, we can't access variables directly, but we can communicate between the main thread and the worker thread using signals and slots. And I alluded to this uh, way back in the beginning of this course when we talked about signals and slots. I mentioned that we can create custom signals. And so far in this course, we've been using a lot of custom slots, but we haven't created our own custom signals. But we can, and we're going to in this course, in order to communicate between the main thread and the worker thread. We're going to write our own signals. And that's very easy to do. The worker thread already has a finished signal that's emitted whenever the run method finishes. And then our main thread can catch that. So if all we want to do is just notify the user that the background process has finished, we can use that. And the user can catch that signal and respond to it with a slot. But you can also implement your own custom signals in the worker class to communicate with the main thread. So maybe after the run method is finished, you want to pass some data back to the main application that the user can use to maybe populate a list box or something like that. Or maybe you might want to send data back to the main application on every execution of a loop that's being run in the worker thread. And this could be a fairly significant amount of data in a Python dictionary because you can pass those back and forth in signals just like any other kind of Python object. It could just be an integer, for instance, if we just want to update the progress bar in the main application on every execution of a loop in the worker thread, we can write a custom signal to do that as well. So let's go back to PyCharm and we'll take a second look at our progress bar application and we'll see some of the limitations of using the process events to keep our user interface responsive. So I'm just going to run this progress bar finished. This is where we left off. And here we have it. We have our progress bar. When we start the progress bar going, you can see it's going. 
Our user interface is responsive. I can move the mouse. There's not much I can do in this particular application, but everything's running good. And it's running good because the process that we're simulating in this loop only takes a tenth of a second. So every tenth of a second, we can process events. Now, what I want to do is I'm just going to add a dial and an LCD number, and we'll hook a dial up to the LCD number. And all it is is just to give the application something else in this user interface to do while our main execution is running. So we can see how that user interface gets interfered with when processes start taking longer than a tenth of a second. So I'll create a dial using the QDial constructor method and in LCD number display using the QLCD number constructor method and I'll connect the dial's value change signal to the LCD's display slot. So when we turn the dial, the LCD number will change accordingly. And then I need to add these to a layout. And I'm going to create a separate layout for these that's going to be a Q H box layout. I will add my dial to the LCD layout and then I'll add my LCD to the LCD layout and then I'm going to add the LCD layout to our main layout. Okay. Let's run this, and it looks like I have an issue on line 23, and yeah, these need to be capitalized. Another spelling error. This is what happens when you try to write code and speak and record at the same time. So here we have our dial. It's hooked up to our LCD display. I don't like that though. I'm going to change this to a slider. That'll give us more room for the LCD display. Yeah, that's better. Now the LCD is larger, the number's bigger. We still have the same effect. If I run this now, you can see the progress bar is being updated. We're processing events every tenth of a second. We can still interact with our user interface. And it looks like we're not blocking this at all. It is blocking, but it's only blocking it for a tenth of a second at a time. So we can't really see that. Now let's change this so every execution of the loop takes half a second. So we'll change the parameter we pass to the sleep method to 0.5. And that'll simulate a process that takes half a second for every execution of the loop. And we'll start this. And now when I do this, it works. But there's a little bit of a lag as I move this slider because we're still only processing events every half a second. And that's kind of annoying. You could almost live with that though. It's not the biggest deal in the world. But let's change this to two seconds now. And I'll start my loop. And now you see it's not responding hardly at all. It does, but it's like every two seconds. And so it appears like nothing's happening at all. Though you can see over here that a loop is still running, but it's really interfering with the responsiveness of our user interface. It's still responsive, it's just not good. So this is a situation which calls for using a separate thread. We'll do that in the next lecture because this one's getting a little bit long. But I think you'll be amazed at how easy it is. And we'll see you then.